to the July 16th, 2021 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's get to it. The housing crisis in Denver is a prominent topic in this week's headlines. The city of Denver is facing scrutiny over its homeless sweeps, with claims of increased sweeps in order to accommodate the Major League Baseball All-Star game last week. Meanwhile, the city is seeking out six civilians to form a, quote, street enforcement team. The team would be granted the power to issue citations to people who appear to be violating the urban camping ban. Patty Calhoun from Westford, we start with you. The street enforcement team, I kind of see this group of Gomer Piles, you know, citizens arrest, and walking down the I, I don't know how this is going to work, but you're much wiser than I. What do you think? It could work, depending. It's smart in some ways that they're taking this away from the police officers, because mm -hmm. that's what it was until last October. Murphy Robinson, the new manager of safety, set up this program where it was mostly city employees. And I think this ad has been mis- um, misdefined that really these are going to be civilian workers like some of the 911 calls went to civilian workers not necessarily police officers they're not the best people to defuse a situation to go over into armed in an encampment when all you're doing is saying hey can you pick up or maybe do you need any help so the team so far has been doing some good work stopping encampments from starting and getting people help so it sounds silly maybe it'll work but so far that team has done a pretty good job i noticed as we drove over here today. It is very, very tidy in this part of town. It's tidy as I drive to my house in in Lodo. Lodo. It is very clean. There was a lot of sweeps that have gone on because of the All-Star Game. Mm -hmm. And really through the pandemic, we've had sweeps. Um, but it was still a good week for Michael Hancock. He, one of the programs to get people into housing first, just came through with a good report that Many of the people, it was successful. It was $8 million well spent. But the city is going to spend close to $100 million this year on dealing with homeless. That's not even getting into the federal dollars that are being used to buy motels and hotels. So it is a huge problem that is not going away. Natasha Gardner, freelance journalist, also author of the Denver Newsletter. Um, Natasha, the sweeps before a big national spectacle like the All-Star Game makes sense to me. Uh, for better, for worse, that's just reality. Uh, the street enforcement team is intriguing. Uh, and I made a little fun of it there, but if you are putting out experts or at least people who know how to get resources versus a police officer who should probably be protecting from you know real crime that's going to be infecting, uh, affecting the city, uh, I could see the logic. How do you think it's going to work? Well, I think there should be a lot of scrutiny, as, as there should be for any new program in the city. Um, you know, they're looking at paying these people between 18 and, and 28 dollars an hour. That's a significant amount um, of the city's budget. And so I think it's worth looking at, is this effective? Do citations actually help with the issue of people being unhoused? Are there other solutions that are better? And that's that's the type of thing that reporters have to follow in the coming months. Um, on another side uh, angle on the story, this, we're hearing that there's going to be a site in Denver where people will be able to park overnight. This is a big deal because it's done elsewhere in the metro, but I think anyone who lived in Denver during the last housing crisis, who saw how many people were living through, out of their cars, and you know, I was certainly reporting on that topic back then, it was which is really um, oh, surprised by how many restrictions there are for people to have that opportunity. We're seeing that that's now going to be an opportunity here in Denver, that people will have a place that they can park overnight. This is again an alliance between the faith community in Denver and um, some creative ideas to sort of look at this topic. So that's another angle of this issue that I'm going to be following, especially as we see the eviction moratorium ending soon. Jesse Paul from the Colorado Sun joins us. It's great to have a member of the Sun here uh, join us at the table. Uh, Jesse, as uh, uh, Natasha referenced, the city is getting creative. So I think we, we, can, we can applaud that part. Um, but I know there are a lot of angles to this story. From your reporting as you looked at this, there's probably a lot of challenges ahead for the city. Uh, what do you think is important to know as we're looking at the most recent solution to come from the city? Yeah, I think, I think that's the big question, right? There's so many unknowns with this program. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is to see how these folks are trained as law enforcement officers because, you know, the folks who are, the members of the public who are going out right now don't have this citation ability. 
that these uh, new people will have. So are these people going to be wearing body cameras? What kind of training in law enforcement are they going to have? Are they going to be able to, uh, who do you go to if you're a member of the public and you have a problem with the citation that's been given to you? So I think those are all important questions that need to be asked. And I think it, this doesn't get at the underlying question about whether or not the sweeps actually work and whether the citations work. Uh, Jen Brown, my colleague, followed a couple around for four months in downtown Denver who kept moving after they were swept. And you know they just kept going to different parts of the city. They didn't really ever get access to services or there were barriers or the services that they got weren't the ones that they sought after. So I, I, I think there's a lot of interesting questions here about deputizing citizens in this way that, that you know, we'll definitely have to keep track of as journalists. Uh, also new to the, the panel, Faith Miller from Colorado Newsline. Faith, it's great to have you here. Uh, another one of the great uh, independent news uh, outlets working here in Colorado. Um, Faith, let's uh, wrap it up for us. As you look at all the different angles the city is coming from, uh, how do you think this is going to go? Um, what are some other things that we need to know about as we see the city uh, taking care of this issue? Well, one argument that we're hearing from homeless advocates about this is we know what works when it comes, or we know what doesn't work when it comes to solving um, the problem of homelessness, and that's enforcement. Um, as we've seen more sweeps ahead of the All Star game, um, more concentrated, it's not necessarily solving the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so advocates are saying that we should look at uh, strategies like permanent supportive housing, which we have some new data showing that a um, uh, study in Denver with the Urban Institute um, did show that permanent supportive housing was a viable solution for getting people out of homelessness. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out and there are a lot of forces at play. So. In, indeed, I think that's a, a good point, and I'm sorry something we'll be certainly covering for uh, the, the weeks ahead. Many Colorado mountain towns are expressing concerns over an overwhelming amount of tourists during a housing and labor shortage. Uh, city, uh, city council members in places like Crested Butte and Telluride are proposing shifting funds from marketing to housing. Uh, Natasha, I guess it's not terribly surprising that our friends in Crested Butte and other mountain towns around uh, the Colorado would be experiencing the same labor shortages that we're seeing here in Denver. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a bigger deal there because there's only a certain amount of audience and, and there's people that just keep coming. It's not like a whole extra, Denver doesn't double in size over the summer, but I imagine some of these uh, uh, smaller towns in the mountains do. Um, does there need to be a larger scale solution brought to, to help uh, mountain towns in this crisis? I think that's interesting because there's certainly some parallels between what various mountain towns are experiencing. What they're doing might be unique to where they're at or what their focus is, but there are some similarities and there's some lessons to be learned from the metro area as well. For instance, you can't just build your way out of this situation. Um, having more housing is great, but there's a lot of other economic factors that come into play here. Um, this is a problem where people love Colorado. We know that. We live here. Um, we love to play here, and a lot of people are coming, and certainly as a result of the pandemic, road trips increasing. Um, but let's also not think of this as a short-term problem. There are factor, several factors that have created sort of a perfect storm right now, but this has been going on in the mountain towns for a very long time. You just have to look at Aspen. What was it? The early 1980s is when when they started to look at housing and, and creating their housing authority, which has had its ups and downs as well. But that this isn't something new. I mean, we have a limited amount of space. A lot of people want to go there. And to do that, you need people to be part of the service industry. How do we solve that equation? I don't know. But I think a statewide effort could give some ground, um, some movement on, on that issue. Yeah, it's a good point about the Roaring Fork Valley, because even before the pandemic, I mean, the, the joke was the billionaires moved the millionaires out of Aspen. They moved down the valley to, you know, Basalt and El Jabal, which moved people out of carbon. I mean, if you needed someone to work in Aspen, they were living in rifle. Uh, so it's... Uh, uh, certainly uh, something that's a new, not a new problem. Um, Jesse, as you're looking at this, I mean, you cover the legislature for Colorado Sun. Do you think um, there's going to be some lawmakers out there that, that want to find a bigger solution? Uh, because just suddenly having new housing for Telluride and some other small cities is not an easy problem to solve. What do you think is going to happen? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, while there are similarities between Denver and some of the mountain communities, I don't know if there's like a one size fits all solution to these different places. Like one of the biggest themes across the state really is there's just no room to build new places. There's there's Aspen can't get any larger, Denver can't get any bigger. So I think that's one of the main issues that we're that we're definitely looking at. Um, you know, I think this will really be a local uh, solution. You know, the, the towns are going to have to figure it out for themselves. I'm curious to see if there's regulations around short term rentals like there have been in Denver limitations on, you know, you have to live in the place in order to rent it out. Uh, but if you've been up in the mountains this summer, I mean, it is crazy packed. I was in Telluride a few weeks ago and, you know, you can't get a dinner reservation. You can barely walk down the sidewalk and, and you, you can just see, you know, tourists are really filling up all these spaces that, uh, you know, workers need to live and, and to, you know, do their jobs there. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a big problem. I think it's always been an issue. I think it's definitely getting worse, though, in some of these places. Uh, Faith, it's it's not as if Colorado wants to put a you no know, vacancy sign out on the you know the borders of the of the state, but I could see some of the uh, mountain towns crying uncle about saying, hey, I, we don't know how to solve this particular problem. Uh, what are some of the issues that you think will be coming up uh, surrounding this issue? Well, there's definitely a lot of factors at play here. Um, there's tourists. There's people who maybe um, make a lot of money and can afford to live anywhere but work from home. Um, and there's not the service workers in these towns to accommodate them. Um, so I think, as Jesse said, it's, it's gonna come down to local solutions. Um, there's not really any statewide regulations that um, legislators will probably be able to pass. Um, but it's definitely, a growing problem, um, even in places like uh, Cripple Creek and Victor, um, not even people like teachers can't afford to live there, um, and there's not a lot of housing being built. I, I think when you bring up Cripple Creek and Victor and, and other small towns, uh, Patty, it, it's not just Telluride and Crested Butte, maybe some of the larger scale ones we think about as tourist magnets. It's all the little towns. And it's not as if Victor has a huge uh, marketing budget, but they're, they're suffering from uh, the same sort of problems. Um, you've done a lot of coverage of not only mountain towns, but um, eastern range towns that have had to handle this different kind of growth. Are, are there some creative solutions out there that you're seeing that um, might be replicated because small towns can get a little bit more creative, they can get a little more edgy with how they solve a problem? Well, some of the small towns have done basically what we're going to see in Denver now with this one church, which is they do have parking, um, car camping that they allow in certain areas that they've done it. The problem isn't just a lack of housing. We have plenty of huge houses that are empty. You know, the people who bought the second homes, the people who bought the second home sight unseen during the pandemic. So maybe what they need to do in those big, rich mountain towns is just for every thousand square foot of house, put a little tiny house for an employee on it and just have the county do it. They're going to have to come up with some solution. In Denver, we see the same problem, which is really expensive housing. We probably have enough housing. It's just so expensive that you don't have people in it. In the ski towns now, you don't even have the options you used to where six people would share a two-bedroom apartment, but they can't even find the apartments now. So the ski towns are going to have the toughest time. I can tell you there are certain places in Colorado where if you want cheap housing, you can still go. I would say the southeast, uh, southeastern, northeastern plains, you probably could still find a house. You can still find deals in Lamar, La Junta, places like that. Exactly. <laughs> Good point. Denver Public Schools uh, school board member, uh, school board director, Tay Anderson announced he would be returning to his duties effective immediately. Anderson voluntarily stepped away from his duties seven weeks ago amidst a private investigation into sexual assault allegations against him. According to the school board, the $50,000 investigation is projected to conclude in mid to late August. Uh, Jesse, we start with you on this one. Boy, there are a lot of angles to this, but uh, Anderson did voluntarily walk away, and now he is deciding to come back, and it was noted by the DPS spokesperson that the board doesn't yet have the authority to say, you know, to have eliminated him from it, but uh, he's not coming back quietly. Uh, there it was qu a quite a noisy conference, and I think he's um, ready to go ahead, and he's not afraid to bring some drama back to the board. Um, how's this going to work for DPS? 
Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I think you got to remember that Denver Public Schools is restarting after the pandemic year, right? And so they've also have got to deal with this investigation that's going on. And I'm curious to see kind of how the two interplay with the important work that they have to do for kids also with this other situation that's that's going on. Um, you know, certainly Tay was giving interviews to folks and to uh, some television outlets. So it was, it was interesting to see him kind of speak out more about this. He's been pretty mum. Um, you know, he's got a lot of allies at the state house, and, and personally I've been interested to see how they've responded to this. You know, Representative Leslie Harris, and, and Senator James Coleman are two people who are super influential. They've kind of kept, I think, Tay at arm's length. I haven't seen them showing up at his press conferences and things like that. So I, I'm curious to see how this ripples beyond, you know, the Denver Public School Board. There's a lot of people who are kind of watching this closely to see what happens and, and maybe not necessarily want to get involved because it's, it's kind of unclear what the outcome will be. Uh, Faith, you ser certainly see uh, Anderson being comfortable being a lightning rod and uh, this affecting much more than DPS. There's uh, democratic politics involved. There's uh, a variety of issues here. Um, what are the things we need to pay attention to as we're looking ahead? I think um, we'll have to wait and see um, what the report says. There's not a lot to say before that. Um, but Anderson is kind of a, or maybe until recently, was kind of a rising Democratic star. Um, he's very young to be in elected office, um, and he has a large following. So um, I think we'll have to see what's in the report and um, go from there. Yeah. Patty, as uh, Faith mentioned, the report is coming, but it's not probably going to be here until mid-August, which happens to be when school students go back to school, which happens to be around the week or so of the DPS board retreat. That won't be awkward. <laughs> no, and we have a new superintendent coming in. That's, he's going to have a very fun job. I am wondering why this investigation is taking so long. We know that no one was really coming forward in public to speak, but you would hope they would be speaking in private. I know that they, for example, asked us, and maybe this happened to other people at this table, to reveal our sources on stories, which if you're doing an investigation of sexual assault, I can tell you we weren't sexually assaulting anyone in our office that I know of. Uh, so I don't know why they are trying to get information from journalists, which journalists are not going to give up anyway. And if journalists actually knew what was going on, we'd all have a better idea of what's going on with this story. So not impressed with the people the DPS hired on this, not impressed with how fast they've been going or how even the DPS board has not been able to speak very clearly on this issue, and also really not very impressed with Tay Anderson in the first place. This week he wanted money for, you know, for his birthday so he could celebrate his grandmother's memory. I mean, that's not really smart either. So no one is heaping themselves with glory during this. Natasha, this feels like it can get really sticky for a whole lot of people. There's, um, uh, as uh, Jesse pointed out, there's uh, high-profile Democrats who are standing behind uh, Anderson. You have himself, who is more than happy to go out in public and say, the whole board threw me under the bus. You have the DPS board, who probably don't need this drama because there's plenty of drama on their uh, plate. And I don't think any of these players are looking for it to necessarily go away. There, there's a certain value to your name being in the news, whether it's for a positive or negative reason. Um, is there a path to, to, to this coming out clean or is it just going to get messier? Well, I would hate to push any pressure to force an investigation to end too soon. But if, if the report just landed this afternoon, it would certainly solve a lot of issues and I think give some clarity to, to many people across the board. You know, a bigger concern for me right now, and part of this is because I have a kid who goes to, to school, is that we are a month away from the school year starting and there are so many discussions that could be happening in the education realm right now. And t conversations like this, which deserve a lot of coverage, are also taking away from that additional coverage. And, you know, um, kids under the age of 12 still ha don't have vaccines. What's going to happen when they return to school in the fall? Um, we know that enrollment has dropped across the district in, in various places. What about the kids that were missing last year that weren't in programs? Where What are we doing to bring them back in August to make sure they're getting back into classrooms? How are we going to make up map, uh, any sort of uh, gaps that people might have had over the last year? And so importantly, we know that the public health 
officials have come out with great concern about the mental health of our youth. You know, what attention are we putting towards that as we enter the new school year? And what resources are we going to have for our kids as they come back after this extraordinary time? I mean, kids are incredibly resilient, but we as a community um, and certainly Denver Public Schools have to be there to support them in this transition time. So I don't know how, that we have enough reporters in the state to cover all of that, but I know that we should all work hard to try to do that. Here, here. Denver-based corporation DeVita Incorporated and its former CEO Ken Theory have been indicted by a federal grand jury this week on charges of conspiring with competitors over hiring offers to select employees. If convicted, DeVita would be fined, could be fined up to $100 million, and Theory could face up to 10 years in prison with up to $1 million in fines. Uh, Faith, this is a big deal when it was released yesterday. Um, uh, what do you think this means for DeVita and for Ken Theory uh, up until at least yesterday, a uh, uh, pretty big motive, uh, political force in Colorado? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different angles to this story, I think. Um, Theory has been an important figure in Colorado politics for a while, he was one of the main backers of um, amendments Y and Z uh, a couple years ago to create independent redistric redistricting commissions um, and change the way we draw legislative and congressional districts in Colorado. Um, and he's also been floated as a potential candidate for governor. Um, so this could potentially hurt his political chances um, as far as running for office. But at the same time, um, Theory and DeVita have been uh, involved in a lot of scandals in the past. Um, I, I won't get into all of those, but um, it's possible, I guess, that he could brush this one off. So this will be one to watch. Uh, federal grand jury indictments that the, those are going to run every day. Uh, how does uh, Theory and DeVita respond? Well, and federal grand jury indictment for you know for being not letting people poach. I guess that's that's why we have we haven't moved on to Washington Week in Review. There's some <laughs> secret cabal that they're not poaching any of the speakers. I've on been the working show. with Vita for a long time to yeah. make sure they can't have Patty Calhoun. It's a, it's, a, it's a big deal. Yeah, I've noticed that. Um, <laughs> It's interesting because he is such a colorful character. I mean, if anyone who's followed what went on at DeVita or The Village, as they call it, you know, he would get up dressed up in Three Musketeers outfits. He would kind of fly around the room. They built this very nice uh, headquarters downtown. But DeVita has been in trouble before on things other than poaching. We've had issues on lawsuits. John Oliver did an amazing takeout, a 24-minute takeout on Theory and DeVita three years ago just on bad behavior corporately that um, I highly recommend. It's fun to watch. So I think of all the troubles they have, this might be the least of their troubles. Poaching seems pretty small potatoes compared to real issues with dialysis and services for the ill. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, Natasha, Patty, there, there's a lot worse things than antitrust laws. So uh, uh, is, this, um, is this the end of Ken Theory uh, being uh, uh, a difference in Colorado politics? Well, I know this is a point in the show where David would give a master class on the Sherman Act. <laughs> I'm unfortunately going, not going to be able to do that. I do not, I'm not an attorney and I do not play one on TV. So um, that being said, you know, this is an interesting thing because there's always names that are, are, are listed in an indictment, but they, they always spread so far beyond that. So imagine if you were an ex executive or somebody who had worked at these companies during that time period and were watching this news roll out yesterday. Um, they probably had a lot to grapple with last night and probably thinking about how it might impact them personally. Um, so I'll be interested in to see some of the reporting related to that, not just the sort of headline news, big names, but also the people um, who were potentially directly impacted by this. Well, speaking of the story, Jesse, you wrote about it. Tell us what we need to know. Yeah, it's uh, it was definitely kind of a shocker. I was out walking the dog and immediately rushed home because, you know, major political figures in Denver don't get indicted by a federal grand jury every day. Um, you know, I, I think that this could be a small peanuts deal for DeVita. You know, I think it's a $100 million fine for them for each count. That's not too much for a company like DeVita. But 10 years in prison for Kent Theory, you know, is a significant amount of time. Talking to kind of his allies yesterday, they were really trying to play down uh, this, these charges and essentially say that they were kind of dubious to begin with. These, this isn't even something that, you know, the, that federal prosecutors have tried before. But, you know, in my experience with DOJ investigations, these things take years. And, you know, a grand jury indictment doesn't happen overnight. There was a connection to a case uh, that was charged in January. 
Um, and on top of that, you know, we know that there is at least one other company that's involved in this that was unnamed in the indictment that, you know, probably will face charges at some point. So I, I don't think the uh, threat has fully been pulled on this one, as a lot of the stories we talked about today. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how Ken Theory, you know, deals with this. You know, certainly he's been mentioned as a political figure and, and all of his money will go around. He'll still have that money to spend. He might not uh, have as great chances of running for mayor, Denver, mayor of Denver, governor, you know, U.S. Senate, whatever he's interested in. Should be fun to watch. Time for our very favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. As always, Ms. Cahoon, please start us off. I have to say the hysteria over the Las Vegas-style shooting that was rumored when as far as I can tell from all the reports that have come down, we basically had some crooks doing a drug deal who were stupid enough to book a hotel room at the Maven where Major League Baseball was about to hold the All-Star game. But the national headlines we made about the fact that we might have a domestic terrorism issue were definitely overblown. Natasha. One of the things I miss during the pandemic were those little moments you share with people at the store, smiles, how are you? Those sort of things that I really appreciate now that we're able to get out a little more. What I don't understand, though, is why people are being so rude to the people who are trying to help you have a good time. So I just hate seeing those headlines, and I wish people just be nice to each other. Here, here. Jesse. Uh, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation announced that they're going to have to start draining some reservoirs in western Colorado in order to keep Lake Powell high enough to uh, produce hydroelectricity. And, you know, it just we have not heard the end of the story of the drought in the southwest. So real, real disgrace about what's going on in western Colorado right now. You're here, and it's mid-July. Right. It's not even to the heat of August. Uh, Faith. Another one from western Colorado. Um, Mesa County is having a hard time with the Delta COVID variant. Um, pretty scary. Over 600 cases um, involving that variant of coronavirus. And they have a vaccination rate of 42% uh, for people 12 and older. So hopefully we'll see that get better, more people get vaccinated. You're here. Time to say something nice about somebody rather quickly. Patty. Seeing people downtown again, whether you went to the All-Star Game or just experienced downtown, there are a lot of great activities. History Colorado has a wonderful concert series on Thursday outside, too. Nice. Natasha. I'm going to be repetitive here, but I am so excited about the Olympics. Um, so, you know, starting up next week, I can't wait to watch. Your ear. Jesse. Uh, former Interior Secretary Ken Salazar, fellow Colorado College graduate, has uh, been nominated to be the ambassador to Mexico. So congratulations to him. Nice. Go Tigers. Faith. I'm just excited that uh, we got a little rain last night in Denver. <laughs> Denver is getting some rain. Uh, you know what? That's a, a very nice, especially uh, with the disgraces of the week. Uh, rain in Denver, I think that's a great say something nice. And, of course, we want to remind everybody here, do not forget that you can submit your questions for a chance to have them answered on the show. That's right. We're opening it up so you can send them to CIO at PBS12.org. Uh, we're excited to include your part and your voice on this program and uh, hope to include you on it. It was one of the things we brought from our show that we did just a few weeks ago, and it was fun for us to do. So for everybody here at PBS 12 and CIO, I'm Dominic Kazuti. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.